All right, I think we can get started. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. It's so good to have you all here. And welcome to the final presentation day for which will commence our final our week this week with the MIT Global Teaching Labs slash Zehra program. We're very excited to have you here and to show the presentations that all of our students have been working on. And um, just to wrap up and celebrate such an amazing week with such an amazing group of people. So before we start, I'm going to do a small introduction about uh, this program in particular, Zehra the, for Education, which is the sponsoring program along with MIT. So I will share my screen. Just a moment. All right. So the MIT Global Teaching Lab. So this is the second session that we have done formally as Zahra for Education with MIT. Um, we are very lucky to have them as sponsors and we're very lucky that we've been able to host this program for two years. So to give you an introduction to Zahra. So Zahra for Education is an education initiative that started in the summer of 2020. Um, to expand educational opportunities between Sudan and the United States. The International Office of MIT is responsible for managing relations with the university and partners in Africa, and the Global Teaching Labs is one of their programs. So this is how this collaboration came about. So the course itself has been a very interactive course where our participants and our students have been very encouraged to um, participate, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, we have been able to do this virtually, um, but it has definitely been a collaboration from both sides. As you know, virtual programs can make it much easier to not be as active or not as participatory, but we're very lucky that our students have been involved from the very minute from, uh, that we started. So this is our teaching team. Um, it is composed of, as I think all of them are here, but uh, Diane Lee, who is an MIT senior, um, Ilham Ali, an MIT graduate student, um, and Dawud Abdul Halim, who has been a postdoc, or is a postdoc, sorry, at MIT. I was not part of the teaching staff officially, but I have been assisting uh, you know, throughout the week. But I myself was up the street at Harvard two years ago, but currently I'm working at the World Justice Project. Um, and then our guests for the professional development day are members of the Zahra team that are doing amazing things um, outside of Zahra. So Abdullah Usman um, is an energy technology assist uh, analyst at Dominion Energy and Emil Al Awad is an embedded firmware engineer at Schneider Electric. And both of them are MIT alum. So this has been kind of an over, this is an overview of our week and what we've been teaching. As you can see, the course itself has been a variety of different cl like classes taught by different people who have had specialties in these subjects. So from SDGs to climate change, to data, to entrepreneurship, we have had a variety of different classes that we've been able to offer and they've all been interactive. And it's been amazing to see how the students have been able to interact and learn despite this just being seven days. So finally, what brings us up here today um, is the project or the final project that the students have been working on all week. So it has been a poster presentation that kind of mimics what research presentations look like. And we're very excited to, these are examples from last year, but we're very excited to share with you the work that they've been doing this week in their own project posters on the topics that they've chosen, which have all been related to impacts or differences that they can make in Sudan, starting from the problem that they've chosen to the solution that they're going to be presenting today. So from knowledge to community action has been the name of our course. And an overview here has been that we're trying to propose social or technical solutions for the challenges that they will see in their project. And so here literally is the commencement of here's the knowledge part and hopefully it will um, lead to Realist, like realistic community action that either our students or other members of the student community can pursue. Here's a, some universities that have been represented um, by our students. They, some of them, are, or all of these are universities that our students are currently attending. And here is an overview of where they're from and where they're currently living. 
here's a just the breakdown of like the years in school. And here's, you know, all of our students come together. So I think that kind of gives an introduction to like what we have been doing, who um, the students have been and, you know, the teaching staff that has brought this all together. And I'm very excited to pass this on to the members of our teaching staff and, you know, let them start the project presentations. So you can finally see the great work that our students have been able to put in. And, you know, what I like to think of is the future of Sudan and the potential that we have to grow and the people who are going to be leaving it. All right, I will stop my screen share. Awesome, thank you so much Sahad for the wonderful introduction and welcome to everyone who is on the live stream. We're very excited to have you here today and have the opportunity to showcase some of our wonderful students. Uh, like Sahad said, my name is Ilham and I'm one of the founders of Zahra and also a graduate student here at MIT. And I've had the, the unique pleasure to uh, mentor these students throughout the week. They're gonna show you some of their wonderful work and we'll go ahead and get started. Every group is gonna present for about 10 minutes um, and then we'll ask them a few questions and we have nine project presentations today. So I'll show you the uh, poster from group number one and then uh, in one minute, they will get started on their presentation. Okay, group number one, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and share your presentation. Start presenting. And we're going to go ahead with group number one. If we can have someone from your group share your presentation. Hi everyone, um, we are group one and our final project is improving English teaching in public schools in Sudan. Um, so this is our team and this is who worked really hard on this presentation. So for today's objectives, we're gonna do a brief introduction and see how bad the situation really is um, what we can do about it, some measurements of success, and a few benefits of learning an English language, and finally, a conclusion. Um, so my name is Dina, and I'm going to give you a brief introduction. And I want to ask, is English even important? And the answer to that is yes. English is a fundamental part of learning and is, embed is embedded in all aspects of everyday life. So it is vital that students establish a strong base at an early age. Unfortunately, the English programs in public schools in Sudan are weak and students end up having trouble transitioning to stages where English is crucial for furthering their education. Okay, let's talk numbers. Um, so we conducted a survey to get a better understanding of what the English programs are like in public schools in Sudan. Unfortunately, we did not have a lot of time to gather as many responses as we would have liked. Um, so we will be working with the responses that we did receive. So out of 20 university students, 45 of them expressed that they struggled with learning, they struggled with learning uh, English in school. And 35 of them found it difficult transitioning into university because of their weak English. Um, and in this uh, 
graph that, sh that shows the grade level that they began teaching English in schools, as you can see, a majority of it is in grade five, which is far too late. So here are some of the questions we asked and their responses. What are some of the challenges you face studying English at school? Some of the responses were, I didn't know it was important. My teacher wasn't that careful about giving us the right skills and knowledge that mattered. It was all about passing the time, the, passing the exam, not learning the language and practicing it in the right way. Another student said, um, the teacher's lack of interest in educating all students equally and, focus, uh, and focusing on students who excel in the English language. And finally, we have a student that said, the simplicity of the exam made me uninterested in broadening my knowledge. We also asked, what are some of the challenges you face regarding English in university? One student said, in my first year of university, I had a hard time understanding some of the lectures. Others said, problems with speaking and understanding certain words and memorizing them. Um, we also asked how they would improve English teaching at their school and what would have been helpful. So they said things like group discussions and listening to audios, um, English book clubs and just generally reading more books, uh, strictly speaking English in class, uh, more enthusiasm during class while learning and having qualified teachers as well as learning how to talk to each other. Um, and others said extra classes to always be reading and writing. Um, one student said language education begins with pre -ed preschool education in addition to improving language teaching methods and not to use direct translation. Um, others said improving the overall curriculum and books and enforcing some spelling rules. So hello guys, this is Omnia Bakri. So I'm going to say, what is next? How can we change this? Is it about students and how to make them better or about teachers and how to just, uh, and what is expected from them? Or is it about educational method? Are we going to change the curriculum? Let's find out. So first we have the curriculum, uh, for the, sorry, the students. For the students, uh, we need to start at the early onset of uh, English uh, of English language in the elementary school instead of just uh, of uh, instead of starting it in the fifth grade, we need to start it in the first grade. Uh, second, we need to increase their in their interest in English, and uh, also turning things they love into English. For example, if someone loves Mithra and uh, like. Method and the the Treasure Island series in and in Space Tone, you can just uh, encourage them to read to read the, the the Treasure Island book, so they can relate to the information. Also, uh, if the parents are educated, we can just encourage them to speak uh, with their children in English at home, so it, which will improve their student their English speaking skills. Then for teachers, for teachers part, uh, they should be first interested in English. Second, they should have uh, soft skills, uh, soft skills like speaking, like public speaking and communication skills to know how to communicate with their to their students. Uh, third of all, they they should have have passed at least one of the English professionals tests like IELTS or TOEFL or etc. Uh, they sh they also should um, like in speak in English in the classes and encourage their students to speak in English so that they can be more confident and comfortable with the language. Uh, then. They should have good relationship with their students so that they can love the, the subject as if they love the student, the, the teacher, they will love the uh, subject as a result. And last but not least, they should also consider student variation in understanding. So they should use different methods of teaching. And yeah, that's my point. Hello, my name is Maha. Maha Khadr. I'm going to talk to you about the methods of teaching. Traditional method, Involving just classes and exams is not a great way to teach students to enjoy the language. So we recommend the teachers find out the students' interests and tailor learning the language around that. For example, have them write about their interests or have them talk about them and do projects about them in English maybe. Have competitions to motivate kids to learn the language. For example, spelling bees, reading contests where the person who has read the highest number of books gets a prize. Summer camp programs to ensure they don't forget what they learned that year. They can join a summer camp program with different activities and learning material. As for the integration of the four skills, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. As for reading, providing proper reading material that not only helps the student learn about, learn in general, but interests them as well. For example, novels, comic books, etc. As for writing, 
Encouraging the students to write about the books they read is a great fun way of introducing writing into their learning. Starting writing workshops for poetry, writing can be beneficial and fun as well. As for listening, watching movies in English during class and listening to music are both great, great ways of easing the language into the students' everyday lives. As for speaking, debate teams and spelling bees are a great way of exposing students to the nature of public speaking at an early age and give them the confidence they need to move forward. Theater and cinema can also be fun and interactive for older students to explore. To explore. Thank you. My friend Maria Fahreddin will tell you about the measurement, uh, the measurement of success. Hi, I'm going to talk about the measurement of success. I'm going to question because I in do we achieve the goals uh, of, of learning language or not? I want to see, are we comfortable with language? We mean, in no, gain a more uh, flexible, gathering it kind of sooner, and make less mistakes who are kind of grammatical or comprehensive. A question is then, you know, do we want to put in on uh, knowledge and understanding of the language? Uh, do, uh, do we want to, uh, to, to broaden our knowledge and understanding to, uh, to, uh, of the language? Uh, we understand the movies books a little better. Uh, the last question is, do we, uh, do we speak in English with regular in our conversation? No, I'm going to get the money. As, uh, as the last question is, do we speak in English uh, with regular in our conversation? If I can't call it Ajuba or at least a little bit, it means we almost achieve our goal. Uh, language. Uh, and there are two branches of benefits. Uh, benefits are general to enhance memory and creative thinking, uh, to improve uh, special ability to command verbal confidence. وآخر حاجة to improve uh, communication skills and we can deal with it more easily. The benefits are sort of special to English, uh, increase employment and travel uh, opportunity. لأن بتخليك to start life uh, in English country. In addition to, in a bit khaliq, titalam other language and give you access to the best education system. Kidam ko halos na topic and thank you for listening. Thank you so much to group number one. Do we have questions from our instructors? Sure, I can ask a question. Um, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, and I want to ask, so for students who are in the taking the same class, but might be at different levels of English. Um, so they're all in the same class. They have one teacher, but they're at different levels. Do you have any recommendations for teachers to address that? And I'm so sorry, but we're actually not done our presentation. Oh, keep going. I'm so sorry. Okay, you can go ahead, group one. Um, okay, so they say considering other problems, uh, other, others as problems give you perspective. Um, that being said, um, learning English in Sudan is not the best, but at least we are learning it. There are some countries uh, where English is only optional and not enforced. Um, for example, uh, Russia, uh, English is only optional, is only optional from grades two to 12. 
and we have Kazakhstan. Uh, English is also only optional from kindergarten through grade 11. And France, uh, it's only optional from grades 1 through 12. And we have in Chad, it's optional from grades 7 through 12. South Africa, uh, from grades 1 through 12. And lastly, Paraguay, um, from grades 1 through 12. All right. In today's increasingly interconnected and interdependent world, proficiency in other languages is a vital skill that gives you the opportunity to engage with the world in a more immediate and meaningful way. Yeah. Whether that is in your neighborhood or thousands of miles away, while better preparing you to compete and succeed in the global economy. That's our conclusion. And yeah, as Nelson Mandela mentioned, Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Uh, yeah, here are some references for the kids to read. Okay, move the slide. Thank you. So these are some references for students to read. And these are our references for the presentation. And yeah, thank you. If anyone has any question, so go ahead, please. Yay. Thank you, Timon. Um, you. Yes. So just to repeat the question, if you have one teacher and students at different levels, do you have any recommendations for the teacher um, to help students individually? Okay. Are you asking about if the, the teacher is um, in different level or what, what, what's your question exactly? Can you repeat it? Yeah. So you, you have lots of students in a class, but they're all at different English levels. Um, and if you give them the same material, some might be confused or some might be bored. Um, so what sorts of things can a teacher do to help that okay. situation? It could be for interaction. So teachers can use songs and use books and at the same time use some pictures and active sessions. For example, they can divide the group into uh, the student into groups, into small groups, and then let them discuss small topics. Also, they can just play for them some songs to sing with them, with Damiani. And also they can just um, uh, give them videos and these things, they, they are going to help them a lot. So there are visual learners, we can give them some pictures and videos, some um, people who are kinetic, so we can just give them active learning, uh, competitions and, and games and these things. Thank you. Is there any, any other question? Great job to group number one. We're going to go to group two now. Uh, thank you guys so much for your wonderful presentation. The slides are really beautiful and you have a great project idea. So thank you guys so much. We're going to put up the uh, slides for or the poster for group two and while they're getting ready to present their uh, their presentation. So the project idea for group number two is to help solve um, contaminated water in Sudan. And I'll show you the poster now. Okay, group number two, whenever you're ready, you can share your slides and start presenting. Just a second. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope my voice is clear. Yes, it's clear. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, my name is Amal Sam, and my team and I actually drink two liters of water a day. So uh, we have been lucky enough to drink uh, unhealthy and contaminated clean water. So water as is to hydrogen, one oxygen, 
uh, as very simple and really uh, important. Why important? Because water is a key of life, a key to survive. And we use water for almost everything in our life. We use water to drink, as I just uh, did, not only for the drama effect, but also because I need it. I need water for my health. And I need water to manufacture water in industry, water in agriculture, water in food, water in recreation, water in heat problems, water in literally everything. So although water is that important, until now, a huge amount of people worldwide and specifically in Sudan having problem in water. They have problem in water absence, yes, but also a huge amount of people having problem of contaminated water. These people, instead of having a healthy water uh, used to, 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 their, to their health, their water gives them diseases. So for all those people who are struggling from contaminated water, for all those people who are right now while I'm speaking going to the clinic because they are they are have been have disease from water. Uh, we are proposing this project for you and we wish inshallah it uh, it's gonna get to the to the impact we hope for. How is that? When is that? Aware that my team is gonna be gonna give it all to you. Starting with is that. Thank you. Thank you, Amel. Uh, Amel, explain why the water is specifically. And now I wanna clarify the exact target area. Of course, we are targeting all the fifths of Sudan in general as a result of important of awareness of water purification. Focus on the most affected and needed to be aware of the importance of water purification, and we also target mother. Writing the level of awareness of the mother who is able to protect a family also, I think that mother awareness is a solution to development in, at the general, as well as people with least education and harmful behavior that pollute water, such as showering, defecation, and so on in water source, as well as all the state and people who are near water source in order to avoid any harmful behavior that lead lead to water pollution. So this, what's a problem that exists community? According to UN reports, contaminated water threatening the life of 10 million Sudanese citizens. People are at awareness by affected of contaminated water. All Sudanese states have issues in water security with different in degree. Deteriorating water quality is damaging in the, envir the environment, health condition, and global economy. Contamination of the food chain, fishing the polluted water, and, uh, and they use the waste water for livestock farming and agriculture can introduce toxins into food which are harmful to our health when eating. And also infant mortality. According to the UN, diarrhea disease linked to lake of hygiene, case the deaths of about 1,000 children a day worldwide. Uh, so how you got the problem about the solution and name we will tell you. Good evening, everyone. I see, I wish you are hearing me good. Today, I'm going to talk with you about uh, solutions that we come up uh, in term of uh, in term of uh, com uh, contaminated water so as you may know the problems uh, sorry sorry i have little problems as you may know uh, we intend as you may know we intend to make a permanent solution for the problem by growing through the main causes one after another and the first season in first reason in the list is the ignorance of people in terms of contaminated water harmful effects in fact many times people do not even know that 
uh, they are using contaminated water. So solutions plans we come up consist from three steps. Step one, start with awareness campaign of contaminated water effects and importance of using water filter. Um, people can avoid what they are not knowing that is coming. And also change always come from basics. And this is what make us choose this as our first step. And after that, we are going to advocate local governments, administrations, and non-profit organizations about harmful effects of contaminated waters in economy, health, and social life, which can be avoided by, by water filtering. Many research has shown that contaminated waters have causes really damage that may be count in millions in dollars in, in range uh, of economy, health, and social life in Middle East and specifically in Sudan and in Al Jazeera. Step two, after we teach people about contaminated water and that they had to filter it, now we are going to help them filter it by help them in building water filter systems and in three levels. Uh, levels have been defined depending on uh, our resource at time uh, we are going to plan, uh, we are going to refine our plan. Level one is a central purification plant that can provide enough water for whole village. And level two will be water filter that can provide enough water for an institution by size of schools or health centers. And level three will be small, small water filters for home use consist from granite and plastic balls and can easily made at home. And this one's we have take an idea from a Nigerian initiative in helping people get clean water. And step three will be awareness campaign for prevention measurement can be performed to prevent water population. And as you may know, sometimes or many times people do provide their water by themselves. Um, this is uh, slides show you um, some of that, uh, some of sharp simplify research that I have uh, talked about, which is about the really damage that can be affected, can be made by contaminated waters in uh, public health and in country or some local area economy. Um, next, my Prevent make, may, uh, Matt will talk with you about the impact of filtering contaminated water. Thank uh, you, Naim. I'll take it from here. Access to clean waters means many things, such as education, income, and health, especially for women and kids. Clean water is essential. So when we guarantee clean water, communities are more healthier and resilient. Are more healthier and resilient. Community are more healthy resilient. Without clean water illnesses, such as diarrhea, parasitic infections, inflammation of the intestine are common. So they can prevent the key nutrients to be absorbed by these people. So we are empowering not to just survive, but to thrive socially, physically, and spiritually. So that why water can change everything. Now we'll go with our next step with Yusuf. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, hello, everyone. I hopefully uh, everyone uh, here listen to me. Uh, now I want to speak about the next step. Uh, the next step, we, we will do the partnership with the government and support each other in order to contribute to solve the water problem. And also we will work with communities uh, as activities such as the group discussions with youth and leaderships in order to tell their people how water is important and how they have great, great roles in their communities. Also we work awareness by radio and television and also we, uh, with the through art, we sense a method. 
We also work with the civil society and organization. In addition to that, also the non-governmental organization also we, which we work in sector of uh, the organization which they, they work in the sector of waters in order to, 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 su to succeed in solving water problem. Thank you. Thank you for listening, guys. Now we are hearing your questions. Well, thank you so much, Group 2. This is a wonderful presentation, and water is a very important uh, issue. Uh, one question that I have, are there areas in Sudan that have worse access to water quality than others? What does the data say about that? Um, yes, uh, many. Um, and all areas in Sudan have different degree in access to waters. And as we have shown in the presentations in second or third slides, um, a map that show um, clean water access or access, uh, access to safe water that people have in different states. As we show, uh, Red Sea may be the worst in this term and North State is the best, as you may see. Wonderful, thank you. We can take one more question from the teaching team. I can ask one. Um, so I'm curious, like for these filtration systems, so you said like there's community level and individual level. Um, do you have any ideas on um, funding and cost and, and how to pay for who will pay for it? Mm, in terms of uh, sensuality, uh, system filters cost between uh, $200 uh, or start from central uh, purification unit will cost will start from twelve hundred dollars and until twenty uh, two thousand hundred dollars upon to area but uh, we have been yet to get a specific source to help us with the money issues but we hope that locals uh, administration and government will help us in this term, specifically after showing this, the economic benefits of that. Uh, as I have shown, um, there are many money, uh, many resources can be provided or used in provide uncontaminated, uncontaminated waters, and that will affect economy in the right directions and with will save us millions of dollars, not just seven. Great. The name was saying, uh, I just want to add a small thing. Uh, we also want to introduce people to a method for water treatment that is really cheap and didn't need so much of a fund, like uh, absorption by carbon uh, charcoals and and like um, a tub, which is a uh, uh, use for for absorption of, of contaminated water and make it healthy so in our awareness campaign we, we're going to focus on make this uh make this ways uh to to help uh, cleaning contaminated water cheap and doesn't need that of a fund and of course we, we we're going to go for to a non-profit organization with our proposal and yeah to to get the fund that we, we want thank you Okay, thank you so much, Group 2. Uh, really great presentation, starting from diagnosing the problem, understanding what it is, proposing some solutions, and even talking about how to work with the community and how to fund the project in the future. So great, great job, guys. Uh, we're going to go to Group number three. So Group number three, I'm going to show your uh, poster, and then in uh, about uh, a minute, then you'll be ready to, to present. So if someone from group number three wants to go ahead and get ready, I'll show everyone your poster now.
Hello everyone, I am Hiba, uh, group three. Hi Hiba. Is my voice clear? I think you are on mute. Can you start again? Hello, everyone. I am Hiba from Group 3. Uh, we live today in the 20th, uh, 21st century, and no one can deny that all progress and development that we have achieved in all fields of life and all discoveries are due primarily to the high level of education of uh, the individual and of society. Society progress uh, develops and the cultural of society de depends mainly on teaching its members to increase awareness and to also uh, and as we also believe in the importance of education and mental health is one uh, and as uh, mental health is one of most uh, important fa factors uh, if effect affecting academic achievement and because of, of it is one of uh, S sdg goals our project was concerned with improving education in sudan Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed uh, Farah. Uh, I was the one overseeing the survey that we did uh, in this uh, project. So one of the things we learned during this uh, course was that in order to solve a problem, we first need to identify it. And to identify a problem, we must measure it. So the goal of the survey was to measure the awareness and the situation of the mental health of Sudanese certificate students. Uh, we conducted the survey on more than 200 uh, Sudanese certificate students, and here are some of the things we found. Uh, we found that a very large majority of students don't believe that their schools and the teaching staffs there take care of their mental health. So uh, there is no uh, uh, care or effort made to take care of these students' mental health. Um, we also found that there should be a, a large group of them think that there should be more efforts to raise awareness about uh, mental health here in Sudan. And uh, uh, I'll pass it over to my colleague, uh, Mohammed al -Tayyib. He can tell you a bit more about this. Hello guys, Assalamu alaikum. I'm gonna carry on on the survey. So we ask uh, also if they, uh, the student, if they are uh, suffering from mental, uh, mental health uh, problems during uh, this year, so 70% of them say that they are suffering, 12% say that, that they are uh, not, 20% uh, say that they, are, uh, they don't know if they are suffering or not. So, okay, then slide. So uh, we also ask them, do you think that uh, families uh, and community uh, should change the way they, that they treat them to better care of their mental health. And almost all of them said that they don't like the way uh, the fa their families and communities treat them and they needed a mental uh, health care. So the problem, uh, we need to define uh, the problem probably in order to solve it. So we asked them in the uh, survey, uh, what are the problem? Uh, that uh, that you are facing, and uh, eighty percent of them said that the, they are they have a, they are afraid from the future uh, of the, and they are afraid from the result of the exam Sudanese certificate examination, and we see that because uh, this examination yani, will uh, determine your future and yani, your whole future, and we we we. <laughs> And a lot of them said that they, uh, they have uh, uh, family's pressures 
about uh, 65 percent of them and about 60 percent of them said that they have uh, academic pressures from the school so Khaled will tell you about the solution that we are we came we came up okay Khaled, go ahead Assalamu alaikum. Salam. Uh, so as we have seen from the survey, uh, a lot of students are uh, facing depression and anxiety, and some of them don't even know that they are having mental issues. So we decided to start a nonprofit organization to raise the community awareness about mental health and to help them to overcome depression, anxiety, panic attacks, all that stuff. So as a first step to communicate with them, we made a Facebook page called Come to TSD. Please go and check it. Um, uh, uh, and we chose the name Come just to tell them that stop for a moment, calm down and take a deep breath. And now I'm gonna let my teammate Ali to tell you what we are posting and what our next future steps. Thank you. Thank you, Khalid. My name is Ali. I'm gonna talk to you about our next steps our, in the future. Uh, first, as my colleague said, we launched a Facebook page. In this page, we are posting tips for the students on how to conquer the pressure, depression, and anxiety. In the future, we will try to connect students with mental health professionals throughout our platforms. We will organize sessions for the students, teachers, parents, and community as well to raise the mental health awareness, to aware the community, to not put the pressure on the students and support them in this stage. We will launch more pages in different platforms of social media to reach a large number of students and community members. And finally, uh, in the future, inshallah, we will, con we will contact with the Ministry of Education to see the opportunity of hiring uh, mental health counselors for the schools, inshallah. Now I'm gonna leave you with Aya. Uh, so, so basically that was our project and the main intention of our project is to highlight the importance of mental health issues and while and how it's been neglected while keep educating the students, parents and educators through the various social media platforms and just uh, in the hope that the like mental health issues will become like vital in the community and how it's and to show the people how it's linked to the academic performance and now we can take any questions. If there's any, yeah, just feel free to ask us. Um, hello, group three. So this is this is amazing work, really. Thank you so much for the work that you did. Thank you so much for the presentation. And I think the people watching the stream should know that you kind of had for three and a half days, let's say, at most to, to work on this, you went on from actually taking the materials, collecting the data, analyzing the surveys, and actually, you know, doing something, taking action with it. Um, our slogan, as Diane mentioned in the, in the conversation here, it is um, from knowledge to community action. So thank you for taking the community action. This is, this is phenomenal. Thank you so much. Um, you. The question I would have for you is, uh, it's great that you already started the platform and that you started it, you know, by a Facebook page, which a lot of the Sudanese community uses. Um, sometimes it, it can happen that some part of the population that you're trying, you know, to, to raise the awareness to might not be on social media. I think it's, it's a very common habit that we have in Sudan that you're going to third year. So turn off all your social media accounts. We're taking your phone <laughs> and, and that, that can be something, right? So how are you thinking a little bit of expanding beyond social media? I think it's great to raise awareness on a first step, but how, what are your thoughts on expanding on this? Um, so one of the things that we had in our next steps or, you know, if the project goes well, inshallah, 
that we would uh, we would have volunteers who would go to in, to physically in person go to schools and give these short and you know easy lectures that you know uh, uh, you should be taking care of your mental health. Here are some of the things you can do. You can do breathing techniques. You can do meditation. You know, try to communicate with your family more. Perhaps there's a communication problem. So the project started as a social media platform, but inshallah, if things go well, uh, volunteers visiting schools and so forth, having in-person stuff, uh, that's also on the agenda. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And well done, great work. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful job, group three. Um, I think you guys did an amazing job going from the data collection to making a solution. And even you have more than one solution, the Facebook page and then going to, to schools in the future. Uh, and a really, really great work. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. One, one question that I had, how hard was it to do the data collection? Because actually you had maybe three, four days to do the survey. Was it hard to get responses? What was your experience like? Well, for the survey, actually, we got very lucky because we have on our team Khalid, and Khalid is currently a third year student. So he was able to, you know, get it out to his friends, his friends, friends, and so forth. So in the span of less than two days, we actually had more than 200 responses. We had about 230 something. So we felt that was a, a good sample size and uh, didn't have too much problems, you know, with the uh, internet uh, connectivity and stuff. And we actually got lucky because we, we had uh, spread the link to the uh, survey on a weekend. So we were like, uh, as Aoud said, you know, you always meet your telephone and, you know, stuff like that. So like sometimes, you know, they'd let them have it on the weekend. So we wanted to take advantage of that. And, uh, you know, uh, it, was, it went pretty well, yeah, alhamdulillah. Amazing. Thank you guys again. <laughs> Thank you guys. Okay, we're gonna go to group number four now. I will show you. So I'll show you the poster and then same thing, whenever you're ready group four, you can take over the screen sharing. Hey everyone, this is Thema Tavli, an electrical engineering student at U of K. And today my team and I will be discussing um, public service centers in Sudan and the problems we face there and how we can improve them. Next, please. Okay, so first of all, um, I'm not sure if everyone here is familiar with public service centers, but public service centers, um, a public service center is a place um, um, that people go to to apply for a certain document, for official documents in specific, uh, such as passports, national IDs, driving licenses, and any other official document. It has three branches. Uh, one in Khartoum, one in Bahri, and one in Umdurman. And the three are facing the same problems, and I don't think anyone likes to go there. So, yeah. Next, please, Mr. Law. Okay, so first of all, we'll be discussing the problems that people face there and the problems that employees have as well. Next, we'll be discussing the solutions my team and I came up with, which we think are best to minimize the problems as much as possible and make the procedures much easier for the citizens. And also we'll be discussing the impact of these solutions and the risks that come with them. Okay, so first of all, I'll be talking about the problems. As you can see in this picture, um, I think it's obvious how unorganized the place is and how these people are being impatient. Um, and if you can see the screens here, actually they're no longer there. And even if some of them are still there, they're not working. So they're practically useless. Um, the first, first major problem with 
um, public service centers is the overcrowd. This place is really crowded and it's is so unorganized. Um, first of all, as you all, all know, we're going through a pandemic. The crowd is going to help the virus spread much faster. So, and people are dying because of this. So, this should be really organized, done in a much more organized way, so that they can reduce the crowd. Um, another thing, and it's one of the most major problems, is not knowing the steps needed to apply for a certain document. Like, first of all, uh, before you go there, for example, let's say you want to go and apply for a for a new passport, you don't know what papers you should take with you and what are the required documents for applying for a new passport and how much does it cost? So you have no idea what things to get with you when you go, when you get, go there. And when you get there, you don't know where to go or what you should do. As you, when you enter the public service center, actually there's, a, there's like a big board that shows, that shows you um, what services are done on every floor, but they're all not accurate. Like they can tell you that the, that the pa passports are in the second floor. And then when you go to the second floor and mind you, the uh, stairs are really long. <laughs> when you reach the second floor, you find that the passports are done on the first floor. And then when you go into the first floor, they tell you, no, you should go to the other office and so on. It goes like that for hours. Um, and even after you know the steps for, for applying for a passport, for example, let's say, um, you get to stand in very, really long lines and queues and wait for hours. And if you got lucky, you, you might finish your, your, um, your procedures in like one day if you're lucky, but most people like take two to three days to be able to fit, only finish their procedures. Then we also have a, the problem of not knowing whether your document is ready or not. Like after you apply, after you take hours or days to apply for the document, they tell you that, for example, let's say come after a month and ask if your passport is ready or not. And then it might take from one month up to six months to get your passport ready. And you know, like you just you just have to keep on going every every a couple of weeks uh, to ask if your passport is ready or not. And then after you go there, they tell you that you need to do a registration, like you need to register your name. And after you register your name, you come and they tell you to come next week. And when you come next week, they, they can tell you that, no, you haven't registered, registered, registered again. So it's really unorganized. Um, also we have bribery. If any, if, um, any of you has been there before, um, and I'm sure most of you did, one of the main reasons for the really long queues and lines is bribery. The employees do the bribery work and ignore the people who are actually standing in the lines. So it takes, they, they stand in the line for hours and they just have to wait until the employees finish their bribery work because it takes the priority. And they, and they don't, they don't, they don't stay in their, in their like counters for, for all the work hours, they go, they might go two hours to have breakfast and then drink tea and then do the bribery work. So it's really, it's really, it's really bad there. Um, we have some other issues. I, I think I've discussed them while mentioning the key issues, which are disorganization and unfair treatment. As I said, they, if they like someone, they might do their, their, their procedures faster than someone they don't like. And also, uh, a main, a one problem is that everyone there, but because of the long lines and the, of the crowd, the employees are always in a bad mood, and they keep they keep shouting. And sometimes they like, sometimes they're like, "We don't want to work. We just don't want to work," and they leave the people standing there. Um, in addition to system server issues, of course, you can you can go and find out that the system is not, is not functioning well today and you have to come the next day and then. So it most probably, like it mainly depends on your luck, whether you can do your, you finish your procedures in one day or not. Um, okay, Mustafa, can you go to the next slide, please? This is a survey we've done. Uh, we've asked people, what are the most problem, 
problems they face when going to a public service center. As you can see, one of the biggest problems, actually the biggest problem is not knowing whether the document is ready or not. Because I think, I actually personally think this is one of the most big problems because you have to go so many times and like it could be really far and the transportation is not easy in this country. Also the other, the, the overcrowding and the long queues. The survey was done to uh, about 150 people from different universities and different faculties. So I we tried as much as possible for it not to be biased. And I think it's not because also, it was done to people living in, like some, some of these people live in Bahri, some live in Umdurman, some live in Khartoum. Okay, that's it. Now my, my teammate Mustafa will be talking about the solutions. Hello everyone. Now that we, we know what are the problems, so what are the solutions? Uh, when when we, we try thinking about the problems and trying to come up with a solution for them, we found that the, the best solution possible is to make uh, a digital platform, uh, a user-friendly website or application. Uh, we, we found that if, if we, we make the procedures or some of the procedures online, uh, that, that will, will benefits the the will benefits the, the centers a lot so we 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 sort of making a platform that contains an account for every citizen based on their national number and have have the required procedures and papers needed to apply for a certain document and a way to do some of the procedures online and uh, an additional to an online payment method and uh, the time and the place uh, of when you could come and receive your documents uh, the the those solutions we uh, we found that uh, if you make the procedures online this will 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 make everything easier for, for the people. Uh, like if, if, we, if every citizen have, have an account uh, based on their national number, they can open their account in any time uh, and look at their passport, for example. Uh, so when, when I need my passport or, or my uh, license, for example, uh, I could anytime open my phone and open the website, enter my account uh, and take the license or the passport. Uh, if a, pol a police officer stopped me uh, at a traffic light or something, I could easily open my, my license and show them. So the, the good news is we found that the website is already under construction. Uh, it's been under construction by, and it's been designed and implemented by the administration uh, of, of computing and communication. And we found that they already did a good job. Uh, the, with the website uh, ha, is already having many of the features that we mentioned. It have a, a place uh, if you want to, to know the procedures. Uh, you could know whether your, your passport or uh, any official document is ready or not, uh, and you could do many other things. Uh, you could get a national ID number, uh, you could get a passport, you could get a, a, a license. Uh, the, the website uh, is also have a new section and have many other features that we, we didn't even think of. So they are doing a good job actually. Uh, but the problem that the website, uh, they, stop, uh, uh, they stop working on the website. So we, we thought of other solutions that if, if uh, in Sudan, not, not, not many people have, have access to the internet and not all of them have 
uh, smartphones that could allow them to use the website. So we thought of other solutions. Uh, for example, if uh, a poster or a map at the entrance of and on every floor showing the steps and the papers needed for every document. Or also, we should keep employees under strict supervision so that they could stop procrastinating, procrastinating and uh, increase the discipline. Uh, improve the system, the system servers to be specific because they, uh, they most of the times they isn't, they aren't working. Uh, or another great solution is making a contract with a telecom we can, telecommunication company to send an SMS containing whether your requested document is ready or not. And actually this solution is not hard. Uh, many companies in Sudan already done something like that. Uh, Bangkok, for example, uh, will, will send you an SMS uh, immediately if you made any transaction. Uh, uh, even hospitals like Royal, Royal Care, they send you an SMS containing a link uh, for, for any, any documents that you need. So we think this this solution is a low cost in case the website uh, the website didn't go well. Next, uh, my teammate will gonna talk about the impact. Hello everyone. I hope you all doing well. Uh, my name is Shema Omar Osman, Group Group Four. I will talk about the impact of uh, this solution. Um, next. Okay, what's the impact of, uh, of the website? Uh, first, you, it makes the procedure easier, will reduce the need for shortcut. Uh, once, uh, if, if, I, um, if you want to do the password or identical card, uh, if you procedure is easier, they cannot need it to pay for the shortcut for someone to do this service. Um, encourage the people to use uh, online method. Uh, encourage people to use online method like uh, like um, Google, like a uh, website that encourage or improve a technology in Sudan. Uh, the third uh, uncrowded place improved the mode of employees and facilitated work. When the employee is uh, feel like it's interested or the in the good mode, in the good mode, the employee will be active to do their work in the good job uh, that facilitated uh, the services in the center. Online work covers the need of employee in the certain area. The employee can work in other in other area. Uh, um, if you if you do the uh, the work in online, uh, can do anything uh, for your social life, um, such as uh, extra working or something. Use the time employees to improve other area. Uh, the employee also can uh, can work in, in two works or three, um, even four job in the uh, in the same time. Reduce the number of facilitated required around the country. Uh, reduce a, a, a work of employees in the country uh, or the around the country. Online payment reduce the prepare. Um, from the prepare, the online payment is benefit for the other uh, to do their uh, payment for the uh, passport or identical card or other something. That's it. My other colleague will uh, continue the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shima. So here we have a case study. 
as what Mustafa said, uh, our solution is a digital platform. So we have an example here, a model, which uh, Saudi Arabia actually are. So uh, actually is a portal of the Ministry of Interior in Saudi Arabia. It's primary aim to provide uh, services like governmental services to the, to the resident and citizens. Next. Next. So what are the benefits of, uh, of Upshift? So the application provides you like over than 280 services for the citizens, like IDs, uh, driver license, uh, renewing passports, and it's also providing you with, uh, with, uh, with the ability to like to pay online and all the stuff. So Upshi has more than 20 million users as in February 2019, and it has been downloaded by 40.2 million time from the App Store. Next. So how does it work? How can I get or fulfill all the features and services of Upshi? Uh, first of all, you need to register an account using your national number and once you have registered, you have to activate your account. Uh, and to activate your account, you have to go to the nearest passport office in the in the country. So that was our model for a digital platform example. Uh, I'm leaving you with Hassan to tell you about the risks about the risks of the platform. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Hassan Mustafa, and I will uh, discuss the risk of this solution. Next, what are the expected difficulties if these solutions are conducted by the government? Uh, first of all, finding software engineers for the web development and the fixing of the web uh, of the website if it goes down. Second, server server issues when the uh, server overloads might become hard to people for some people to uh, to sign in for the for the profile. Then periodic maintenance, then security issues. Some people will have uh, concerns about security issues because you have to pay online and you have all of your legal documents online. So, so you, it might be concerned to someone that the website might get hacked, the uh, legal documents might get leaked. Next. So what next? Uh, we should urge the government to complete the website by putting the matter in public, which would force the development team to provide measurable results more quickly. And another common approach is for the government for the government to outsource the development process to our private con contractor, which may be suitable, may be more suitable in terms of technical quality, but may be raise some valid concerns about transparency and corruption issues. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Now? Well, I think you guys did a really amazing job with this presentation. Um, you answered almost all the questions from the beginning to the end and you showed a lot of different kinds of solutions. Um, I think it's, uh, it's great that you brought in that the government has already started on the website, but they have um, not finished it. And what are some of the solutions for that? You also talked about maybe some alternative solution like using SMS or text messages for people who don't have internet, uh, having better posters and better information at the center itself. So I think a really, really great job from beginning to end. So great job, uh, team number four. Uh, one of the questions that I would have, what are some of the differences that you might think from, for example, Saudi Arabia's, um, their experience, what might be different in Sudan, and how close are the case studies? Uh, okay, I think the first difference is gonna be uh, uh, this in here in here in Sudan we don't we don't have not all of the people have access to smartphones, 
uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, smartphones is a common thing. Uh, they even you could even make a you could even make a passport, for example, uh, immediately from your phone by entering your fingerprint. But here, uh, here in Sudan, not all of the people might have smartphones for that. Uh, so I think in Sudan, actually, a website is a better solution, uh, not an application, because a website you could access a website from any computer, any any smartphone. Uh, it uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you you should have a smartphone. Amazing! Thank you so much. Awad, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I think this is this is great work. Well done, Group 4. I think one thing that I find quite interesting is that um, for some of the challenges that you wrote there, it financial wasn't a challenge, although I think when we compare lots of stuff being done in Sudan and other places a little bit more wealthier like Saudi Arabia, finance comes into question. So do you think that by actually providing mobile services, this is saving the government some money in a sense from the paperwork and the cleaning and the crowding? Or um, or not, and is this something that you think you can be able to quantify and see how much financial benefit can actually be um, gained from those investments into the software or the website uh, to actually encourage the government to take those steps? Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, actually, in, in Saudi Arabia, the Absher app for Saudi Arabia uh, has saved them about three million uh, papers already. So using a, a, a digital platform will, will it, it may sound costly at the beginning, but on the long term, it will have many benefits uh, and it will save many money. Uh, if, if the procedures aren't online, that means uh, in the future, you're gonna have to make many, build many buildings uh and that's is gonna be way costly so i think uh making the procedure online is the best solution this is great yeah i really like how you also thought about that expansion money for physical buildings is something i think it would be i mean this is fantastic work and i think um, if you guys keep on working onto this and actually quantifying uh the impact financially as well you can make a very very strong case and uh, great work well done Okay, thank you so much to group number four. Great presentation. So we're gonna go now to group number five. Same thing, we will show you their, um, we're gonna show you their poster. And then group number five, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and take over the screen sharing, just like the other groups. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Hello, everyone. Uh, is, hello, everyone. How is everyone doing? I hope all of you had, I hope all of you ha had a wonderful day. Great presentation so far, everyone. And those of you who haven't presented your projects yet, I wish you all the best. Unfortunately, one of our team members, Abdurrahman, is actually sick, he has the flu, so he will just be sharing his screen with us today. So our presentation is going to be our, about misinformation and the dangerous effects it can have on society. So without any further ado, let's jump right into it. Next, Brahman. Next, Abdurrahman. I mean, can can you hear me? Can Abdurrahman hear me? Next, Abdurrahman. So, what is misinformation? 
by definition, misinformation is false or inaccurate information that is deliberately created and is intentionally or unintentionally propagated. Even if later retracted, misinformation can continue to influence action and memory. Furthermore, research has shown that while people may know what the scientific community has proved as a fact, they may still refuse to accept it as such. Um, there's similar uh, terms that may easily get confused with misinformation. For example, disinformation also refers to inaccurate information, which is usually distinguished, distinguished from misinformation by the intention of deception. Fake news also refers to information in the form of news, which is not necessarily disinformation since it, and since it may un unintentionally, may be unintentionally shared by innocent users. Rumor refers to unverified information that can be either true or false. Next, other one. Is there a problem with my mic or something? Can any, everyone hear me? Can Abdurrahman hear me? We, we can hear you. Uh, please go to the next page, Abdurrahman. So what are the causes of mis the spread of misinformation? Uh, many different things cause misinformation, but uh, the underlying factor is information literacy. Because information is distributed by various means, it is often hard for users to ask for questions of credibility. And often, uh, misinformation can be politically motivated. For example, Biden's, mis uh, Biden's underperformance in majority Latino areas in Florida may have had a lot to do with the fact that before the election, Cuban communities were unindicted, unintended by a photo that has been floating around on, so, on, on social media. It claims to be Joe Biden next to Fidel Castro, which is not true, obviously. The image was, the image, the image actually shows Castro with late Norwegian explorer Thor Herdal and his wife, Jacqueline Peer. Uh, misinformation is sometimes unintended side of bias, misguided opinions can lead to the unintentional spread of misinformation, where individuals do not intend of, uh, on spreading false propaganda, yet the false information they share is not checked or and referenced. Another reason for the recent spread of misinformation is the lack of consequences. With little to no repercussions, there is nothing to stop people from posting misleading information the gain they get from the power of influencing other people's minds is greater than the impact of a removed post or temporary ban on Facebook or Twitter. Next page, Abdurrahman. So what are the channels that uh, misinformation spreads through? Obviously, uh, social media, TV, newspapers, and in internet such as, such as like search engines, Google, Bing, and so on. Next page, Abdurrahman. So what is the impact of misinformation? Uh, misinformation has economical, economical impact. An example of this is on April 23rd of 2013, the Associated Press, press put out the following tweet. It said, Breaking news, two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama is injured. This tweet was retweeted 400 times in less than five minutes. This false news was propagated by Syrian hackers that had infiltrated the Associated Press Twitter handle. Their purpose was to disrupt the American society, but they disrupted much more. Automated, automated trading algorithms began trading based on the potential that the president of the United States has been injured or killed in this explosion. This sent the stock market crashing, wiping out nearly $14 billion in equity value in a single day. And another example of this misinformation about Pepsi CEO saying supporters of Donald Trump must start their business elsewhere. This made Pepsi's sentiment score fell 35% uh, below the average score. Misinformation can also ca cause hatred against minorities. 
these types of social media misinformation campaigns can spread the what what has been called genocidal propaganda for instance against the rohingya minority in burma or triggering mob killings in india uh that was my part i will leave you with abdullah from now good luck abdullah So hello everyone, hope you are all doing well. Um, I guess in the, in the past uh, two years, we have always been uh, hearing uh, rumors, misinformation and fake news about the, the COVID-19 crisis. And a great example for this is the man of Arizona. One of the misinformation that has been, uh, went, that went really viral in, Amer that really in America is that chloroquine, uh, which we all know it's uh, anti-malarial drug used to cure malaria, is, 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 can you go back, please? Uh, chloroquine, is, which is an anti-malarial drug, is, is, uh, can provide some sort of good treatment for, for COVID-19. So due to, to this misinformation, uh, um, a man from the state of Arizona, he consumed a lot of chloroquine. Uh, regarding the fact that it's good treatment for COVID-19. And unfortunately, due to the high consumption of the chloroquine, the man lost his life. Uh, another, 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 good, another good example is some sort of uh, personal sad story that I went through. Uh, uh, we have a neighbor. She is a little bit more old woman. Um, I was chatting with her. We we're talking about the vaccine, the COVID-19 and so on. So I asked her, did you get your vaccination? And she told me, no, I asked her why. She told me because uh, I don't believe there's something called coronavirus at all. It's, uh, it's all fake news, uh, it's some sort of conspiracy theory that uh, America had spread this virus to, to attack China or maybe China are doing it to, to attack America. So she didn't believe in the virus. Uh, unfortunately, she had been tested positive for COVID-19 and uh, she lost her life. Uh, I guess the impact is really obvious right now. Can you move on, Abdurrahman? Next, please. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, here I can bet that uh, every one of us today, the first thing we did after we woke up from sleeping is simply we picked our phones and keep scrolling on social media. So let's talk numbers, guys. Uh, the internet penetration in, in the world is 62% uh, percent of the world population, which is equivalent to 4.9 million people. Um, but if we are talking about the social media penetration, it's nearly 57%, which is roughly, I'm talking about like 4.5 million people of the world are using social media. Next, please. <coughs> Digital and social media can contribute to the spread of misinformation when users share information without first checking the legitimacy of the information they have found. Uh, basically, why social media is, is like the best medium for the misinformation to be spread on is because we, 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 we don't use like any first checking mechanisms. You know, if you see an information, um, maybe you have some of your friends next sitting to you, but you simply are not going to ask them if this is true or not. We are not using like a fact checking websites to be sure if, if the news we are seeing is correct or not. And why is this? It's simply because of the, because of the psychology of our brain that social media platform have aligned uh, with their software. <coughs> social media platform are basically built on uh, raising engagement. You know, the reason why they are addictive is uh, we, we always expect, expect new things. We always, Maybe you are expecting that your friend uh, have written a post about a joke. Maybe you are waiting for your friend celebrity to, 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 to publish like a, a video. So we are always expect things and we are always feel rewarded when we, when, we feel, when we find out what we are looking for. So when we get rewarded, it's basically this increases uh, the flow of the levels of uh, her, the hormone of dopamine, which is the, the hormone of happiness. So that's why we are always keep scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And we don't need to do anything else. Uh, this next paragraph is just an emphasis of uh, what we have, what I have said before. So go, go, Abdurrahman. 
here are the reasons why misinformation spreads easily on social media. Uh, the, first, uh, the first great example is the lack of regulations. Um, this is one of the biggest problems we are suffering in, in the world of day to day, uh, in the world of data today. Uh, and a great example is uh, the ex employee, Frances Haugen, who was an ex employee at Facebook. She basically lost her best friend due to misinformation on Facebook. As a result for this, uh, she went and testified in front of the senator committee with, uh, with the proof documents saying that Facebook uh, is, is harmful for, for, for teenagers. And Facebook had a really huge impact uh, on, on the spread of, of misinformation. And unfortunately, nothing happened afterwards. The senator committee didn't do anything. And this is the biggest problem that we... Uh, the next reason is algorithms. Uh, I guess we're running out of time, so I cannot get in depth talking about algorithms, but mainly social media to, to, to enhance our engagement. You know, whenever you see a tweet or, or, or a post that gets many likes, many comments, many retweets, it's most probably gonna be on your feed. So you're most probably gonna see it. That's why those platforms are built and, that, and that's how they are making money. So this is the biggest problem. Uh, and it's, it's the most easiest way for misinformation to spread in social media because of those algorithms. Uh, the third reason is Facebook's inconsistent censorship of misinformation. Uh, here, there is a huge contrast uh, that we as a team, we have been shocked about it, is that most of the Facebook users are from outside uh, the US and Canada. You know, this is not the problem. The problem is that only 30% of the money Facebook spent uh, spent on, on monitoring information is on the content from outside uh, from outside uh, Canada, from outside Canada and the USA. So this is a gap that we need to bridge. Uh, Facebook do have some mechanisms to tackle the misinformation, but only if the, the posts are written in English. So if you, if you write a, a new or a post or whatever in, in another language rather than English, it's probably gonna appear and we are go we're all going to see it and it's going to spread more easily. Uh, the final reason is the private messaging apps. The problem with the private messaging apps like, like WeChat, Facebook, and so on, is the end-to-end -end encrypting is the end-to-end -end encryption um, mechanism? This simply means that even WhatsApp, even Facebook themselves, they cannot see our message, they cannot read our message, and this is a problem uh, because with this with this mechanism, uh, informa misinformation could, could spread uh, very easily because there there's no any censorship, any regulations, anything that can stop us from spend, from spreading this uh, misinformation. So thank you guys, uh, move on. I'll stop hey. here and let my friend Ala complete from here. Thank you. Thank you, Abdullah. Hey, I'm Ala. I'm gonna talk about social media in Sudan and the impact of misinformation um, in Sudan. Um, according to a study that was made um, in January, 2021, um, there were 13.7 million people in Sudan who used internet, um, which is equivalent to 30.9% of the population. And according to another study between the year 2020 and 2022, um, the numbers of internet users in Sudan were increasing, it increased by plus 2.4 percentage. Um, now we're we gonna look at the chart data that can okay okay um, this chart data uh, shows the Sudanese people's usage of uh, different social uh, of different social media apps such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. Um, we can see that Facebook and Twitter and YouTube are the most used applications by the Sudanese people. Um, uh, from the year 2018 to the year um, 2021, as you can see in the chart, okay? Um, can you move to the next step? Okay. Um, Abdullah already mentioned um, the impact of misinformation in Sudan on the health sector by mentioning uh, his uh, previous, uh, by mentioning his personal experience. Um, but now we're gonna look at it uh, from a different angle. 
as we already know, um, the last three years in Sudan, the political situation was not stable. Demonstrations were regularly held and protests, uh, they, they had schedules, um, so people mainly were, were yeah, used to depend on social media uh, to spread awareness about the political situation in Sudan, to spread awareness about the importance of demonstrations. People also used social media um, to know the, the timings and the places for gatherings, to know which places to go to, which places to avoid, and where to go to get medical treatment. So basically, Sudanese people were using social media um, to make their revolution work, okay? Um, but on the other hand, because they want to change the government and take down the government and so on. But on the other hand, people who supported uh, Omar al-Bashir, who's now in prison, um, were doing their best to sabotage al hajj okay? Um, they, they started with what we name in Sudan currently a Dijajal electronic pages. They are mainly pages um, managed by RSF, uh, which, is, which, which stands for Rapid Support uh, Forces. Um, they, they, they are trying to tarnish the image of the civilian government. They try to frighten people. They try to, to spread misleading information and stuff like this, okay? Um, uh, so we, we really thought that we really think that we need to work on this, especially in the uh, political situation is still not stable. Fa last year, Facebook uh, shut down around a uh, thousand accounts that were attracting more than six million followers. Um, well, well, accounts the, were managed by uh, the RSF. Okay, so this was their approach to help the, the Sudanese people solve this issue. But the problem still exists and we, we, we still suffer with this. So I'm gonna let Hanin continue and let you know guys what we think of as the best solution to solve this issue. Thank you, Ada. So some of the possible solutions are teaching people how to spot misinformation on social media and using common sense to be more skeptical, use fact-checking resources, and use tools like Google reverse image. Raising awareness and educating the community about the dangerous effects of sharing misinformation and how to spot misinformation on social media. Um, um, using Google reverse image search to, to fact-check videos or images you suspect are altered. It's simple to use and it works just fine. Use social media to talk more about the misinformation's effect on society and interviewing those who were affected with this problem before. A key problem right now is that many communities don't have the same fact-checking resources that English-speaking ones do. Arabic language fact-checking sources are thin on the ground and are very limited. For example, Arabic fake news detection, AFCN, RFX and MissBar.com, but these are often small organizations and the people running them are outmatched and understandably exhausted. So groups like these badly need resources to better match the challenge that they are facing. Launch a fact-checking website. Another possible solution is launching a fact-checking website that supports the five most spoken languages in the world, Mandarin Chinese, English, Hindustani, Spanish, and Arabic. So we can help about 2.5 billion people benefit at the same time. There needs to be public pressure on platforms to do something about all forms of misinformation, whether they are in English or not, because a whole lot depends on this. Another possible solution is um, transfer transparency from social media platforms. We want to know how Facebook's fact-checking algorithms work. How does the data combine with the algorithms, algorithms to produce the outcome that we see? We want them to open up and show us the inner workings of how Facebook is working. And if we want to know these social media effects on society, we need scientists, researchers, and others to have access to this kind of information. But at the same time, we're asking Facebook to lock everything down to keep all the data secure. So Facebook and the other social media platforms are facing a transparency paradox. We're asking them at the same time to be open and transparent and simultaneously secure. This is a difficult needle to thread, but they will need to thread this needle if we were achieved, if we were to achieve the promise of social technologies while avoiding their peril. The final thing we can think about is algorithms and machine learnings. Technology devised to root out and understand fake news, how it spreads, and to try and dampen its flow. 
Next slide. So the impacts of the possible solutions are by launching our website, we will hopefully reduce the spread of misinformation and a more truthful in, uh, create a more truthful internet community, avoiding issues and old world diseases such as measles from returning to society. So measles is a highly infectious viral uh, is a highly infectious viral disease. The vaccination developed in the 1960s almost eliminated measles from the earth, but rumors and conspiracies about the supposed side effects of the vaccine have led to some parents preventing their children from taking it. Another impact is an educated community more aware of the consequences of spreading this information and the negative effects it can have on their lives and the lives of those around them. So to conclude our whole presentation, sorry, next slide. So to conclude the information, uh, our presentation, the information age is great because we were able to benefit greatly from the information it provided us. But misinformation can still play a large role and negatively, in, negatively affect our lives. So we should start being responsible with how we handle and receive information on the media and on the internet. Thank you. So now if any of you guys have any questions, opinions or thought, please proceed. Uh, I just want to mention that is, uh, there is a Saudi initiative Let's work uh, fighting rumors. I send the link in the chat for reference. Okay, thank you guys so much for your presentation. Um, I think so for on the on the side of the solution, what are some things that are maybe specific to the Sudanese context and how we use social media that's going to affect how you approach this solution? Are there certain ways that people share information on Facebook or on social media that are particularly important to think about? Can you guys hear us? Okay, so the question is, are there specific ways that Sudanese people use uh, social media that's going to affect how you're implementing your solution? Uh, definitely. Like, the thing is for this fact-checking website or fact-checking in general, is the major source of communication in Sudan is using WhatsApp. And WhatsApp has encrypted messages, so they have no type of way to kind of track what information is being sent around. So definitely from the misinformation being spread in different platforms like Facebook and Instagram that have certain rules that can like track their, have fact-checking algorithms aren't like WhatsApp. So definitely the spread of information on WhatsApp being misinformation on WhatsApp. Okay, thank you guys so much. It was really cool to see the breakdown of different social media app use in Sudan and how that changes over time. And then some of also the examples that you guys brought in were really great. So thank you guys so much. We're gonna go to our next group now and we're gonna try and um, we're gonna try and stick to 15 minutes for all of the presentations that are coming uh, because, uh, because we have, um, four more groups that are left, okay? So we're gonna start with the next group now. And then, yeah, go ahead. Okay, hi everyone. How are you? Um, about uh, the connection between poverty and education. Yes. Um, this is my 
with my group, yes. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, Malaz, Ethan, and Mohammed couldn't make it to the uh, to the presentation for personal reasons. Yes. So here we are, me and Saida and Dudan. So uh, let me just uh, start with. Yeah, so when you have guys schools in challenging communities, when you where you have a lot of poverty, where you have a lot of instability, where you have a lot of mobility, teaching and learning can take a fat seat. And as we all know, education is a basic human right that open doors for people to lead healthy lives and, contrib and contribute to their communities to end extreme poverty by 2030, as we all know from the SDGs, we must invest in the lack of access to education is a major predictor of passing poverty from one generation to the next and receiving an education is one of the top ways to achieve financial stability. In other words, we can say that education and poverty are directly linked. So, uh, the problem is that about 260 million children are out of school around the world, according to the UNESCO data released in 2008. Many, 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 many reasons, but absolutely poverty is one of the main reasons. So, uh, as we can see here, it's uh, the relationship between the children rate out of the children number out of school and the and the country's income. So we can notice here that the countries with low income, the children rate that 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 they are out of school are very like like uh, like more than than the high income countries. The high and we don't mukarana it's way agilla mean the uh, the low country's income rate of school of children out of school so from another perspective نمشي لكده يعني ننظر للموضوع من من ناحيه ثانيه the negative effect on education برضو education has an increasingly positive effect on poverty ليه لانه proper and proper education will increase the 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 person's like um, skill and and the increase of the potential for higher income يعني زول لما مثلا يكون ماخذ البكالوريوس ما زين يكون ماخذ الماستر ما زين يكون ماخذ ماخذ الدكتوراه فيعني كل ما زادت ال 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 and knowledge حقته كل ما زادت opportunities أو كل ما ال potential of income كان حيكون higher. So with each additional year of schooling or earnings, earnings increase by a الزول دريته العلمية يزيد كل ما earnings حقته increase by about ten percent. And for every dollar invested in additional year of schooling, earnings increased by five dollars in low-income countries. So uh, let's go to a study. It happened in Jamaat al Almania in Egypt, and um, okay, um, the study aimed to measure the impact of education in. by addressing both of the theoretical treatment of the mechanism of impact of a role in education in reducing poverty. <clears throat> With a study conclude that the relationship between spending on education and poverty was negative in different geographical areas in Egypt. And this means that increasing spending on education leads to decrease the likelihood of the family falling between the poverty line. And the results of the study also indicated that an increase in the number of years 
family is less likely to fall below the poverty line. And that is the potential impact of the education on poverty in the countryside is higher than the European in Egypt. So in traveling back Sudan, we can see that over 3 million children in Sudan do not attend to school. The severe gap in the education system continues the cycle of poverty in the country and the chronic underdevelopment and the conflict are two of in Sudan are out of school. And also girls face additional hardness such as cultural pressures and traditional views that prevent them from receiving an education, while 76% of primary age children attend to school in secondary, the number drops and in, in, in the secondary schools, the number drops drastically to 28%. So yes, we continue with Saita. Um, thank you, Mara. Hello, everyone. I hope you're doing well. I'm going to talk about the Sustainable Development Goals, which set up by the United Nations in 2015 with the intention to achieve them by the year 2030. There are 17 goals and 169 targets that the United Nations member states agreed to work with the vision of a world free from poverty and hunger and disease. I put the pictures of four of them, which relate mostly to our project, which are no poverty, that targets ending poverty in all forms everywhere, quality education, which ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Third, we have gender equality education, which promote lifelong learning opportunity. Sorry, we have gender equality, which targets achieving gender equality and empowering all women and, women and girls. Finally, we have decent work and economic growth, which promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment and decent work. Next slide, Maram, please. Okay, second, we have a map that is showing a literacy rate in the year 2015. It estimated the population older than 14 years old that have the ability to read and write. As you can see, the lower rates are in the African continent, obviously, and the higher are in Northern America, Europe, and, and whole Australia, up to 95%. In the other side, we have the poverty rates. Uh, next slide, Maram, yes, thank you. We have the poverty rates based on the national poverty rates. As you can see, they go in line together. That means that most of the countries that have high poverty rates will have low literacy rates. On the contrary, we see that countries with low poverty rates will have high literacy rates. So almost non-existent in Northern America and Australia, which is the opposite with the African countries and Southern America. Okay, next slide. Finally, I'm going to talk about the impacts. Education and kind of, I will mention uh, girls' education. Okay. Educating girls is beneficial for both genders because educated women tend to be better mothers and to, be ha to have more knowledge about nutrition, healthcare, and raising children, their children in general. In addition, research shows that educating girls help with the economic growth of the family and the country's labor because more girls working, more females in general, that means more labor more economic growth. In fact, it also affects child marriage, since girls will be more aware of their rights and can decrease, decrease even domestic violence. It also improves food security and reduces malnutrition because when they know about agriculture and farming techniques, they gain the ability to grow and maintain healthy crops. Finally, it reduces the spread of diseases which is proven by research that it is extirpated by lack, by lack of knowledge since they will learn that they need to stop using traditional techniques that help spreading deadly diseases. Okay, thank you very much. Now we'll go to Ludan. Okay, I will talk about the solutions we found. 
uh, when we Ew. have to reduce the cost of education. Oh my God, Several African go. countries have abolished their school fees. <laughs> okay. First, we have to reduce the cost of education. Several African countries have abolished their school fees each time. Uh, the move has triggered a large increase in primary school enrollment. For example, enrollment increased by 12% in Ghana, 18% in Kenya, 23% in Ethiopia, and 51% in Malawi after the abolition of school fees. Second, we have school lunch programs. It has been proven that malnourished children learn poorly. However, according to the World Food Program in 2009, 66 million school children are hungry. Providing, school during school, uh, providing food during school will elevate these children's hunger during class, as well as encourage regu regular school attendance. School lunch programs have been shown to increase math scores, student con uh, contraction, and general achievement. For example, for example, uh, sorry. Has been shown to increase more. Has been shown to increase math scores, student con uh, contraction, and general achievement. For example, providing non fit vitamin pills to children in rural China, many of whom have anemia, had an immediate positive impact on learning. Three, we have educating parents. A parent's investment in education is crucial for the success of their children. However, 759 million adults are illiterate and do not have the awareness necessarily to improve both their living conditions and those of their children. Providing parents with information on the value of education will be crucial to increasing and maintaining school enrollment. In Madagascar, uh, for instance, this can be achieved for as little as $2 per child, and the benefits could equal 600 times the cost. Uh, for we have a new educational model, investing in test scores and achievements, is no longer a useful way to focus on education. According to the Stanford Social Innovation Review, a new educational model should combine, combine uh, traditional content with important financial health and administrative skills. Students should also practice teamwork leadership, uh, teamwork leadership and, cr and critical thinking. They should also gain exposure to internship projects such as identifying and exploiting market opportunities through business ideas such as community recycling. This shift away from standardized learning will prepare students to make a, posi a positive impact on the social and economic well-being of their communities. And five, we have improved resources for teachers. Com uh, computer assistant learning will inev in inevitably improve education in developing countries and enhance the educational experience of both teachers and students. The computer should have an age appropriate uh, learning software and technical educated staff that knows how to maintain them. Uh, this method to improve education and will continue to encourage students' enrollment. And most importantly, will ensure that children stay in school and learn more, more while they are there. And finally, we have to expand educational opportunities for girls because there is a lot. Uh, there is a lot of cultures that doesn't believe in educate, educating girls. Thank you. If you have any questions or anything, just feel free to share them. Yay, that was a great presentation. Um, so yeah, thank you for doing all that research, especially with like a smaller group presenting today. Um, so I'm curious if you know or have any more details on kind of the link between why um, poor popu poor populations um, have lower education? Is it like a matter of school is too expensive, or you know, um, teaching is like the school is too far away, or it's not available, or if there are competing responsibilities at home, like if students need to help out with um, work at home, or if like like what is that link? Um, do you have any? thoughts on or ideas on like how that's measured? <clears throat> yes, okay. I'll answer you, Diane. Firstly, mostly because of uh, money, like poverty and having no classrooms and not 
not qualified teachers. So in poor countries, you either have no teachers or unqualified teachers. And sometimes they have to prioritize between food or teaching their and most because they need to survive. So that's most of the reasons. And having no funding. And because in most countries, governments don't give the proper money and for education. And also, uh, I want to add something to what Sajda said. Uh, because of the, um, the poor families prefer their children to work and to bring money instead of going to to schools and, and give them money. They just want them to work and to and to to bring money for the family. Yes. So I guess okay thank you so much uh, to the group. This is a really important topic uh, on poverty and especially the, the impact that education has on it. And I like the statistic that you guys brought in that every year of education adds a certain amount of money to a person's income, right? Because that really helps in, in reducing poverty. And you guys had some really great examples. So thank you so much. Okay, okay we're going to go to the next group now. The title of their project is Green Land is a Cure for Poverty. Okay, um, hello everyone. I'm Rohan Al Tlaib and I'm going to talk about green land is a cure for poverty. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay, um, our project uh, is trying to link uh, the use of agriculture in decreasing the level of uh, poverty, hunger, and increasing the economy of the country. So I'll start with explaining our two main points, poverty and agriculture. Uh, poverty refers to the lack of enough resources to provide the necessities of life, such as food, clean water, shelter, and clothing. While agriculture is the key for the development and rise of sedentary human civiliza civilization. Okay, Sudan is known as the next global food basket. And uh, this, this name was given because Sudan has an arable land of about 170 million, uh, million acre. Okay, and it was estimated to be capable of meeting around 40% of the world's need. Our project will be taking place in this place, um, as you can all see, Khartoum in Mugren. Um, I'm going to talk uh, more on the statistical uh, data. Statistics. Okay, in 2018, um, Sudan gross export. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. In 2018, Sudan gross export was about uh, 1.82 billion, and in 2019, it decreased to around 1.58 billion. Um, the share of employment in agriculture, industry, and services. We found that the level of employment in the agriculture field is decreasing from around 45% in 2010 to 38% in 2019. So this project is going to increase the employment in the agricultural field. So um, Jamal will talk more about the community we're targeting. Okay, hello. Uh, so we're targeting the community around uh, Al Mugran area to our uh, farmers uh, who are under the poverty line uh, to be specific. We choose pharmacies in this area to avoid the transportation cost because uh, nowadays the transportation is so expensive. Then we go to the places near Al Mugran this time focus on, on, on people under the line of poverty and we provide them with jobs. So by this way, we create jobs opportunities and contribute the culturing of lands that was not used. 
because the incomes of an, an individual in Sudan from agriculture about $4,000 annually. And if we are multiplying the numbers of pharmacies, we contribute to the progression of the economy. Thank you for listening. Hello everyone, I want to talk about the problem. The phenomenon of the poverty is one of the most important daily misfits by human society. Government and social uh, theories since ancient time. In ancient time, the phenomenon of poverty was linked to the loss of uh, resources and high unemployment rates. It was among the youth least to uh, stagnations in the national economy, which reduced investment of um, opportunities and this deepness of uh, poverty in society, especially at the family. Among the causes of rural poverty is the uh, continuous space toward ur uh, urbanization in the development is, uh, strategies that have been put in place science independence. This appear in the neglect of the traditional agricultural scatter, uh, scatter on the which the majority of the population in Sudan depends, taking interest in the irrigated uh, scatter despite its weak contribution to the national product. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Amal Mahidi. I'm going to talk about solution or design. Uh, our project is going to take a place at a Mugrin area in the capital city, Khartoum, Sudan, where the blue and the white meal confluence. Al Mugrin is an area under the bridge uh, linking Khartoum to Umdurman city. It's one of the most fertile lands in Khartoum. It also has a very close source of water and need. Uh, and there, may, there are many landowners and farmers who live there. Okay, our idea was to approach a landowner who, uh, are, who are not using their land or looking for a farmer. Uh, and we suggested them the idea of providing them uh, workers, resources, such as uh, tools, uh, livestock, uh, seeds, poultry. In return, uh, they should allow us to use their land for the project. Okay. Uh, we will only choose one land uh, out of the surrounding land to start our project because El Mugre uh, is, is used for seasonal planting due to the rise of the need uh, during wet season. Then, after that, we will make a memorandum understanding between the workers and the landowner, that, uh, sta which states that in return of the work of the farmer's work, the landowner has to pay them cash. Uh, now, Ma'ab is going to talk about the impact. Thank you, everyone. Hi everyone, I'm Maha Busama. I'm going to talk about the impact of agriculture in reducing poverty. The first impact is poor households may gain directly as producers. Everyone, including the children, can contribute directly to the general well-being of the family unit. Gain positive progress for the women in traditional family farms, not only in the equality, but also in reduced global poverty. 
Another impact is the help for people to diversify their sources of income. Agriculture, agriculture work uh, can be a minor source of nutrition, nutrition uh, while the family earn its major income from other sources to reduce family poverty. Making agriculture more productive and sustainable help reducing hunger. As agriculture plays a key role in food security and poverty reduction, uh, as we actually know that uh, Sudan is a food basket for the whole world. The another impact is that uh, stimulate economic development growth help lead to the job creations and increase food supply and also raises uh, the incomes of the people and reduces food so prices. And when we reduce the, the food prices that uh, can lead to uh, the food will be available to all who need, who need them especially the poor sector in the society. And when the food uh, will, be will be abundance to all who need them, uh, the, the children can continue, continue to go to their, to their uh, school. And that, will help, uh, in the, and that will help the country in the future to develop and uh, reducing the poverty. We have a lot of countries that implement the agriculture as a solution for the poverty. Uh, as Malaysia, which is a country that, uh, which is the country that we all know that in uh, growing cotton and extracting cotton oil from seeds and exporting it to the countries. And now we all know that uh, Malaysia is a powerful country. Now uh, we'll let you with my colleague to continue to talk about the next steps. Hi, everyone. To be talking about the next step. Our next step is focused on how to raise money for the party. We will start the running marathon in Khartoum, Al Mugan, or Nile Street. We will request the largest university of Khartoum, like Al Ahbad University or Al Sudan University. Of the money we will be taken to support the project, we will then approach different organizations who are interested in our project. Any question? Okay, this is this is a fantastic presentation. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think a quick question I will have um, for you is that in Sudan, sometimes we have the problem of people buying and owning land just for the sake of buying and owning land. Um, so how do you see this? How do you see that this becomes an issue when approaching some of the unused land owners and suggesting that you can provide the workforce and the tools for their land to be put into good use? So, uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. Um, so my question was that sometimes people in Sudan just like to own land, right? And, and this is the problem you're trying to tackle. Um, if you do find, you know, some of the land, some of the agricultural lands that you would like to, you know, provide opportunity for people to farm and to put into production and the owners of those lands do not necessarily want their land to be used by anybody. How do you think you can negotiate or convince people that this would be a good idea for them and for the country? Well, we could try to convince them by saying, um, help us, uh, I don't know, what they, that's what they usually say. So we can help other people, uh, like you have a land and you're doing nothing with it. So why don't you, like uh, benefit from your land and at the end you're going to gain some like an am amount of money at the end of the year if you want any <laughs> and if he said no then uh, i think we can find another land yeah, this is this is i mean there's a lot of land yeah but this is something yeah. to keep in mind but okay great work well done yeah i also wanted to say great job to this group I think you you understood the problem and you made a very specific solution. Uh, and you have uh, 
the details about the MOU, how you would work with the farmers, how you would pay the workers, and even you have like some, some more details in there. So I think it's a, a really well thought out project. And uh, I, would, I would love for someone to actually carry it out in Sudan. So great job, guys. Thank you. All right, wonderful. We're going to go to the next group. Uh, thank you so much to all of our groups so far. The next project is called Al Khartoum Al Jadida. So talking about the sustainable ways to build new solutions for cities. Hi, everyone. I'm Ada. I'm an IT student at University of Khartoum. Uh, me and my teammates are going to present you a work project today. So first of all, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. OK, great. Let's start. So have you ever hoped to live in the future where everything is elegant and quiet and completely eco-friendly? Well, here we introduce you to our project, Al Khartoum Al Jadida, which seeks towards making Al Khartoum a sustainable city uh, through addressing some of its challenges and putting the most essential blueprints by suggesting policies and some technical solutions. But first of all, what is a sustainable city? So, a sustainable city or eco city is a city designed with conservation of environmental impact inhibited by people dedicated to, minim to minimize the requirement of the requirement input of energy, water and food, waste, uh, waste output of heat, air pollution, CO2, methane, and water pollution. So we began our project by asking ourselves, what are the most crucial problems we can solve in order to achieve cartoon sustainability. So the first problem, we found out that uh, insufficient and unstable house planning and design results in an organizable city and unstable community and generally like generate a visual pollution. And the next problem was uh, reliability on hydro energy. So one of the biggest disadvantages in using, uh, using hydro energy that it's environmental consequences like drought and limitation in plant locations. And it's basically so expensive to build like hydroelectric powers plants can cost as much as like $580 per kilowatts to build. And they usually range from 10 megawatts to 30 megawatts where one megawatt is equal to 1,000 kilowatts. This means like uh, the, the upfront cost of building hydropower plants can uh, like cause millions of dollars. Um, uh, furthermore, like it causes water pollution and noise pollution, as well as it turns the underlying water also and also air pollution because it's carbon and methane emissions and so forth. So the third problem uh, we faced is a responsibility of waste disposal. Like um, as anyone of uh, as any one of us can see that um, waste is as is, is at every part of our tool nowadays, and uh, people are just throwing waste without any system, any sense of responsibility, which is can lead to deadly consequences, as we will see later, and generally spoils the beauty of the city. The last problem we are going to try to tackle here is self-deficiency in the nutrition sector. We all know that Sudan is basically an agricultural country and there's so much uncultivated lands that are able to be cultivated, but they are like 
like they're not making use of it, unfortunately. They are not even make use of the existing uh, projects, agricultural projects like Jazeera projects, their project, they are not making uh, the maximum benefit of it. So uh, moving out to the solutions we are like suggesting today. Uh, solution number one is optimizing planning and housing design. Solution number two is using renewable energy sources. Number three, proper ways to spoil the message for energy, uh, ensuring food security and an urbanized food systems. Um, so yeah, we will begin by clarifying the solution number one with Mustafa, but before, uh, before I just wanna make a quick disclaimer that um, our sustainable city like Al-Khartoum Sustainable City uh, is like actually based on the Dubai Sustainable City with a few adjustments so that it will be executable in Sudan and like every city uh, in Sudan. So yeah, Mustafa, you can go. Thanks, Mayada. So the project is a practical implement of the social, economic, and environmental sustainability. Or in other words, it's self-sustaining. So I want to start first by the, something called the buffer zone, which is, a, oh, uh, okay, I'm going to start by a few picks from the regional model. So it's an example of where this model should lead us. Uh, the buffer zone is a triple layer scheme built of 2000. 500 trees with the post cycles and horses tracks between the layers. And second, there is a, the main park or the central park, which is a flourishing park runs through the entire length of the city, containing several outdoor facilities from fitness and sports stations to court and kids zones. Uh, next, an important part also is uh, the greenhouses, which is the uh, Levin Green Biodemos, located through the lens of the central park with so the total of 3,000 square metric for urban farming with the low energy cooling systems that relies on the, on the pressure. Also, we have the residential clusters and the original model have five of them with a total of 500 villas all connected to the main park and each villa is staffed by solar panels. And the facility in the original model is the sustainable plaza, which is a 15,000 15, square metric mix it mixed use area located near the entrance of the city so the outsiders can use it too. With the five floors and, and above the ground containing shop, cafes, offices, apartments, studios, and so on, the plaza is considered as one, one of the main income sources for the city, especially in terms of these. Also, the city has a mosque with a capacity of more than 700, 700 worshippers provided with innovative technology to minimize the water and the energy consumption with a unique architect design. And so as a facility, school, clinic, different centers, hotel, and so on. May I that you can go. Uh, so the next problem we have is uh, using renewable energy sources. Uh, Lubna, you can continue. Okay, so hi guys. Um, so firstly, the principal design element of this model is to achieve a smooth transition into clean, sustainable energy production and reduce the intense consumption of energy in our daily lives. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Ahmed, can, yeah, okay, just saying the slide. Uh, okay, uh, the first consideration we took in the design is the usage of the International Building Code and making sure the city rises to its standards. Also, this model is built for using on a long term without having to modify greatly in its infrastructure, as this is firstly expensive, secondly tedious, and thirdly counterproductive. Another consideration is the usage of eco-friendly construction materials and increasing the utility of the materials by using what's left post-construction uh, in other things. Um, so you can think of this really as some sort of recycling. Um, the energy in, this, uh, in the city is completely solar and the solar planes are placed on all the rooftops of the buildings as you can see in the picture below uh, and also over the parking slots. This way, the solar planes aren't seen for the residents and do not harm the aesthetic visuals of the city. As for the villas themselves, they are oriented facing the north so as to maximize the amount of shade they get during the day. Moreover, the paint used on them is UV reflective, 
and the windows to walls ratio is reduced in the design of the villas. Thus, the total, thermal, uh, the total thermal gain is by far less than average. And all this reduces the energy used in houses, lightning, and ventilation. Um, the last, I'm sorry, can you see the slides? Um, I think the slide share was stopped. Uh, Maya, is there a way that we can go back to the slides or whoever was sharing? I'm sorry. Thank you. Now it's back. Uh, okay, so the previous slide, I have it. Thank you. Um, um, okay, so as I was saying, the last, uh, the last planning aspect we'll present uh, is the mobility within the city. So the city has a strict no car policy. That is to say that no cars are allowed within its parameter. This adds more safety and reduces the percentage of carbon emission generated by vehicles. Um, so the alternatives provided are basically using bicycles and walking. This also contributes in elevating the health status of the city's residents. Of course, there are a few exemptions to this policy, since it is rather difficult for the elderly, pregnant women, and those with special needs to use the alternatives we've mentioned. A number of electric cars will be available for them. Um, Ahmed, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So um, on the topic of energy consumption, stats have shown that approximately 48% of, of the total generated electrical energy in Sudan is used in houses and buildings, lighting and ventilation alone. We predict that this percentage will rapidly decrease due to the smart design we've implemented in the city's buildings. Next slide, please. So as you all know, Sudan is highly dependent on hydroelectric generation of power in supplying it with energy. Uh, here, my nerdy mathematical and computer science mentality obliges me to ask three questions about Sudan's status quo in energy production. So number one, is there a solution? Yes. Number two, does it work? Yes. Number three, can we do better? Of course. And here's how, solar power. Using the strategy layout of solar production mentioned before, we aim towards achieving one of the principal design elements previously stated, that is to achieve a smooth transition into clean, sustainable energy production. Um, I'll leave you with my colleague Abdullah to walk you through how we manage the waste disposal in the city. Now we walk into a more Sudanese based issue. Trash. As you walk down the street, you see trash everywhere. In fact, according to an article in 2018, we produce 7.76 tons of trash per year. And all the 66% is collected. And that number in fact have decreased during the past few years. We will solve this issue in, uh, in the sustainable city by placing bicycle trash, bicycle, uh, bicycle, recycle bins with divisions according to each section, paper and plastic recyclables in general, plastic waste and solid waste. For plastic and paper, we're gonna recycle it, which will cut the production uh, recycle. We will recycle paper and uh, pa paper, plastic, paper, plastic and glass, which will uh, decrease the carbon emissions compared to the production from scratch. Secondly, for waste, we can use it as fertilizers. It's more beneficial for the environment since chemical waste Produce, can contaminate water and in fact contribute into the uh, global warming negatively. And according to a study held by the UN, we use 8.6 kilograms of chemical fertilizers per hectare, which is a lot. As you can see in the graph, it's been increasing rapidly for the, uh, for the past few years. For solid waste, which makes about 20, 24% 24 24 of the waste, 
we can use a method called energy waste energy disposal, which produces energy by incinerating them, uh, incinerating them to produce energy. This, in fact, this in fact uh, clears area for more for a reforestation, which has been, which could have been used for landfills instead. Could have been used for landfills, but because of this, we can use it for re uh, reforestation. I mean, next slide. Additional benefits. All this recycling and job will create jobs into the market. That will increase, that will reduce the job un uh, unemployment that has spiked after, 20, after 2020. Also, there is less visual pollution and it reduces the production footprint in total because of recycle. And next. Ahmed, your turn. Yes, assalamu alaikum. Uh, our farming project is a big agricultural project that is designed to support, support our sustainable city model. Uh, the project's main goal is to sustain food security and urbanize food system. Uh, it also tends to provide jobs and opportunities for the city residents. Uh, the project is designed on two main points. First point is that it works on farm to fork procedures, which is a famous procedures, by the way, uh, which is planting seeds and after the harvest, packaging them uh, and then distributing them to local markets without the intervention of any third party. Uh, the, without the intervention of any third party, which will give the project products a great price. Uh, second point is that the plants or seeds are chosen carefully based on specific data that shows the most necessarily um, profitable plants for the city. Okay, next thing we have, uh, the project will be split into three segments. The first segment uh, is a solar farm and a vertical farm. Solar farm, as you can see, is a farm that produces crops, electricity, and livestock livestock which, which will also provide us with natural fertilizers. After the solar farm, we have the vertical farm, or we can say the farm that works on agriculture 4.0, which is a new tech agriculture uh, design. Uh, it's a practice of growing crops in vertically stacked layers. It also provides controlled environment, which gives us the privilege to plant whatever we want, whenever we need. It also runs by advanced ways and machines such as temperature and moisture sensors are robots. Uh, next segment is farm lands to be rented by local residents in order to give them uh, to give the people of the city more chances and opportunities. Uh, it has a very strict rental policy uh, that obligates the rental a specific number of plants or seeds to be chosen from, uh, which to be choose to choose from which one to plant. Uh, in their land in order that the government can control the city export and achieve sustainable and economical system. Finally, we have other facilities to the farming project, uh, which is the last segment, by the way, facilities such as uh, automated production line for packaging, a meat shop, grocery store uh, with even cheaper prices, uh, for the farming project workers to buy from. And also a logistic and distribution team to distribute the project final products. And I believe the rest may add. Thank you. So yeah, after all these product pro solutions my teammate had introduced, there's a lot of impact in this project. So let's see them together. The first one, of course, is sustainable, uh, sustainable cities and communities, which will be achieved after combining all these solutions uh, mentioned together. Uh, then the good health and well-being, which includes sustainability, reduce uh, death, illnesses, and chemical, chemicals, and air, water, and soil pollution and contamination, which are sustainable city tackle all of these together. Uh, next, we have clean water and sanitation. 
So our project were able to, ta uh, to tackle the target number 6.3 of the SDGs, which, uh, which uh, its ultimate aim is to improve water quality by reducing pollution, uh, eliminating dumping and minimizing release of chemical materials. There's also target. Uh, there's also target number six point uh, six, which it's uh, it's aimed to protect and restore water related ecosystem, including mountains, forests, rivers, and so forth. Also, we are helping in achieving the zero hunger goal through the agricultural products that will be generated through the the farm project. Uh, which uh, in the long term are going uh, to make the city self-sufficient and we're going to be heading towards the zero hunger goal. Uh, next, we have decent work and economic growth. The, uh, we, we were able to tackle the target number 8.2, which, uh, which, which is achieving a high levels of economic productivity through uh, diversification, uh, technological upgrading, and innovations. There's also target number 8.3, which is uh, promoting the development orientation policies that supports production activities and decent work opportunities, and so forth. Uh, we were able to tackle the, uh, the goal of industry uh, innovations and infrastructure. Uh, which is to develop quality, reliable, sustainable, and resilient infrastructure. Um, there's also the, 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 the goal of uh, responsible consumption and production, where we're able to achieve the target number 11.5 by uh, reducing waste generation and planning to actually start uh, recycling and reusing. Also, there's target number uh, uh, 12B, which aims to develop and implement tools to monitor sustainable development impact for sustainable tourism that creates more job opportunities and promotes local culture and production. And production. Um, the last thing we have here is um, climate change. So in the climate change, we were able to tackle the target number 13.2, uh, which is integrating climate change measures into national policies and strategies. So let's move on to the next step. Where is the slide? I think Ahmed lost connection for a moment. Okay, he seems to be back. So what is our next step? The next step that should be taken is to start actually implementing this model in Khartoum, even if we start by like baby steps. Uh, over time, we will have our city sustainable and we would be able to scale this model uh, furthermore to cover all Sudan. Also, anyone can contribute to this by raising social awareness about the importance of recycling or even like the, 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 the beauty of making tables and furniture from construction waste. In fact, it looks really good. Or using renewable energy sources because it's completely friendly or or it's even possible to just start uh, painting our houses with UV light reflection paints, that would be great. And yeah, every single action you did count towards this goal. So the next slide. So here we have a vertical scenario to, to have just a rough uh, estimate of how much impact would be created by the application of this model. And here are the results. These are the results. And so yeah, that was uh, pretty much it guys. Thank you for listening. And yeah, we were like, we are ready for the questions. Excellent, excellent job, group eight. I really liked how you all had multiple solutions and detailed like um, paths for how to get to these solutions as well, that both included what I think like top down, like government ways, more like state ways that you can um, implement a sustainable city, but also bottom up, like how individually. 
um, we can be a part of creating these like sustainable cities. I wanted to ask you more about that and just like how you want, how you all would imagine implementing this. I know you all said this would be a long-term project, but do you envision that this would be something, if you could, like you would propose it to the government or is it something that you would start with like an awareness campaign on the grassroots level, having people do small things like painting their homes or changing their lights or whatever to build up to a sustainable city? So yeah, definitely. Um, it is it is sort of a large scale project and uh, we can't really start doing it like from scratch, like from day one. So we will start uh, first like by promoting exactly how important uh, climate change is in Sudan because it's a serious problem and we really don't we really take it for granted um, the next step would be yeah to start implementing small solutions one by one uh, maybe even start managing uh, uh, like uh, waste uh, disposals because um, it is uh, like the cheapest one mentioned and it's it's probably like um, it has really elegant and, and easy solutions from there on there are like um, so when when we uh, like we really do want this to reach the government, but like um, it doesn't only have to be like solely um, like governmental. So there are like um, uh, like uh, some um, uh, some outsider um, like funding uh, uh, private or, or private institutes that are willing to like fund fund these sort of projects, like um, uh, Ryra. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, definitely, it would be a great step to see something like this come to Sudan. And yeah, I mean, it would definitely say that Sudan did sort of make this huge improvement in in like social awareness and uh, climate change awareness. Amazing! Thank you all so much, and thank you all for um, your proposal. I am fascinated and would love to see this be put into play. All right, I think we can transition to Group Nine. Isham, do you want to set up the project poster as the group gets ready for their presentation? Yes, so we have group nine. They are our last group, last but not least. But thank you so much to the group uh, proposing the sustainable city. It's a very, very beautiful presentation. And I think I speak for all of us. And it's very inspiring to see this vision of Khartoum or other cities in Sudan. And we would really love to see this go forward in the future. So thank you guys so much. Okay, I'll show you briefly um, what group, our last group has uh, proposed. So this is a night school initiative for women and young children. So group nine, whenever you're ready. Uh, hey guys. Uh, Alright, can you go to uh, slide number three? Alright, can everyone hear me well? Yes. Uh, Alright, so uh, to start off, I'd like to tell you of my group's initiative, EdDev, which is uh, short for Educational Development. It is a group vouching for the development of education in Sudan. It aims to battle the rising illiteracy rates in children in Sudan and deal with the issue of low education and schooling rates to ensure that the children of the nation get a fair chance in education. Uh, first of all, it's necessary to know that Sudan actually has one of the largest number of out of school children in the many children, uh, in the many region, sorry, which is the Middle East and North Africa region. And this is a result of many barriers of, uh, to schooling in Sudan, which include poverty, geographical disparities, uh, gender inequities, and conflict. So over 40 people in Sudan actually live below the poverty line and struggle to make money. This in turn forces some families to choose to make their children work and make money instead of going to school. And this again in turn causes literacy rates to go down. So as we learned before, quality education is actually the fourth in the United Nations 
Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, and um, our initiative at Dev works to develop it in Sudan in order to battle, battle illiteracy as its consequences are various and they include poverty, poor employment opportunities, unemployment, welfare dependency, increase in crime levels, lack of awareness, social barriers, and uh, there are much more, but uh, yeah. Al-Fadah, you can go. Hello, all. Uh, I, I'm Al-Fadah. I will talk about the community. Uh, in Sudan, many school age children are out of school. The most uh, vulnerable groups are girls, children affected by war, refugees, and uh, internally displaced uh, person. Children in rural areas and children from poor households, uh, in, ed in addition, uh, there were high drop out, out rates, especially for girls and children living in rural areas, uh, most affected groups. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm Mohammed Shannan. Uh, the problem which I'm going to talk about is the literacy in Sudan in general and the literacy of children in specifically. Honestly, it's a big problem and we need to solve it not, uh, not only in Sudan, but all over the world. Unfortunately, people in Sudan suffer from, most people in Sudan suffer from the literacy. And which confirmed my words uh, that the UN said say that out of every ten people, in, out of every ten Sudanese people, six cannot read or write. And, write. Uh, and this is the big number. And this, also, this literacy is uh, it's, it's diffused in the states of Sudan, such like Blue Nile, Kassala, uh, and, and West Darfur. Uh, can you hear me, guys? Yes, continue. Thank you. Now let's talk about the literacy of, of children, literacy of children. In Sudan, there are more than 30 million children between the age of 5 and 13. And, six, and 63 of them, 63% of them cannot go to school. And this category contains the age group between 6 and 11, who are supposed to enter their primary stage. Uh, and unfortunately, 54, uh, 54 uh, like something like this. And if we ask ourselves, if we ask ourselves, what is the reason behind poverty? Most Sudanese families send their children to work uh, to help them with the with house. Because this, those children, those children have uh, uh, time or even money to go to school. And we found a solution for this. I will let you with a smile to, to talk to you about this solution. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. I am Ismail Ali. I will talk about the solution. Uh, firstly, I'll, I will talk about the source of the idea. So, one of my friends who work in orphan sponsorship organization, he told me a story about uh, one time he had an interview with a poor family, uh, a family with a low income. So uh, he noticed that the family have around four children that they are not going to school. They, know, they don't know even what school is. So the mother said in her defense that she works all day long and she has, uh, she has to take care of the children as well. So if they, uh, if she if she want to take care of the children during the day, why do why don't they go to school at night? So, the night school initiative is uh, a, a, our project we're working on. I'll talk briefly about the design of the of the school itself. We have uh, several points. The more the main point is the resources that we are going to base off is the location, the school itself, the human resources such as teachers the volunteers, the guards, the supervisor, the analyst, the psychiatrist, nurse, and we need an emissary from the Ministry of Education and also the parents, the parents association. So the financing method, how we get money for this project. There's 
uh, we think about three uh, three methods, three basic methods for for funding this project. Uh, the first one is the primary one. We can go to ask companies and institutions in, in the general area to finance as social responsibility, which is a term in Sudan uh, refers to giving money to nonprofit organizations as they can uh, improve their projects. So this is a primary. The basic, the basic funding method is going to be a direct fund from national and international organizations in the field of education. We found out that, that there are more than six big, 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 very big uh, organizations working in the field of education, and they, they have like large funds from the government. And so uh, they, we will we'll contact with them as they can fund our project in several ways. This is the basic. The secondary, we, we can get uh, donations from the areas association. So our target in the project uh, is the children from age six to 12, which is in primary school in Sudan. Uh, the children are from poor families or low income families, families where, uh, which they prefer them to work over study. So they have uh, income to, to make them study, but they prefer them to work to hide their income. Uh, also orphans, orphans who, who are, don't have uh, parents, so they can't even uh, live, by, live by themselves. Uh, either study. So also, we have a target, uh, uh, another target of the project, which is to improve the way of education. So we have experienced teachers who are retired, so they can not work in the, in the field of education no more. So the period of the school is going to be uh, between uh, all the week, except for Friday, from 5.30 to 9 p.m. is going to be during the night. So the educational process. So uh, the study materials for the kids is going to be focused on four, four main subjects, which is religion studies, Islamic religion, uh, Arabic language or uh, linguistics, uh, math and calculations for, uh, and science. Uh, we also uh, have plans to improve the, the subjects and the materials for study. Uh, we have also some fun activities to, to them to go to make the children want to go to school and have fun on it. So, uh, as so science experiments, they can have experiments at the lab. Uh, they can have movie nights. We can, uh, we can have some movies for them. They can have tours of museums and amusement park. Uh, they, they also can have cultural library so they can develop in the cultural way. The basic, the basic structure uh, of the uh, the basic structure of the or the management of the of the project is going to be there are a supervisor. The supervisor of the supervisor of the project has direct control of the project as part of the executive committee. He is the head of the executive committee. There also uh, he also is responsible of uh, of monthly reports and annuals to the project executive or us, the EDEF group. Uh, the executive committee also uh, the, the executive committee is com is composed of uh, several centers such as media center the health center the academic center the finance center the activity centers and the research center all to improve the project and manage it in the best way possible so i'm going to Hiba to talk about the impact of the project Hello guys, my name is Hiva and we'll talk about the impact and effectiveness of our project. Uh, of course, the third thing is the reduction of the children illiteracy at the area of concern or the school uh, night will apply. Uh, okay, and the second important uh, thing is especially uh, through our media center at the Ismail mentioned, mention, uh, we will increase the awareness of the illiteracy consequences, illiteracy consequences at uh, individual, family, and a national level. Okay, 
And third thing is our project, uh, it's managed by the area association and volunteers and staff will be selected from the area itself. So this make most uh, of it itself managed, uh, self-funded and easily to govern. Um, make the solution from the society will increase the local support and awareness guys. Fourth thing is, and also as uh, we mentioned before, the executive committee uh, will have a psychiatrist that will contributing in improving child psychological state. Uh, then this will will have a positive effect on the family too. Uh, also, the interactive learning activity will contribute it, uh, in enhancing the mental state of the children and a psychological uh, positive effect also. Last thing is we have analysts to measure children academic scores and measure the effectiveness of the program at the society through the effectiveness tests. All that, uh, all that to, yeah, to assure uh, improvement of the children grades and social awareness uh, to achieve the main goal of us is the reduction of the children literacy by our uh, program school night initiative and uh, then we talk about uh, our next step with al -Fatih. thank you so much Uh, hello, uh, hello again. Uh, I will now I will talk briefly about improvement uh, our project and the next steps in it. Uh, I will start with ways that can help us in developing the project. Uh, in order to be able to know what needs to be done to develop the project, it is necessary to product to productively follow up on the reports and analyze the data inside it. And I will talk about post gradual. Reports are sub submitted uh, by the supervisor responsible for the school, which includes functional and administrative uh, reports on how uh, the school is operating. Uh, these reports go to the data analyst uh, who analyzes the reports submitted uh, to him and show what, uh, what is needed to fix some problems, if any, or develop some things and uh, analyze the data show what we should do. For example, we can develop the project uh, gradually uh, inserting uh, the number of students or opening uh, opening other school in the different states of Sudan, depending on that data. Uh, and in the next steps of the project, we will address a number of points, namely national and international uh, development, UNESCO and UNICEF. Uh, on a national basis, we will work on developing education through our project, as we share as we share search it. Uh, for states uh, with lower educational levels and found that they are the states uh, of West Darfur, Blue Nile, Kassala, Kurdufan, and Kurdufan. Uh, they are the states uh, most in need uh, of the project. So they will be mainly targeted by the project and we will work on developing the project in general through Sudan. Uh, at the international level, we will try to implement the project and send it is, uh, its idea to the United Nations uh, so that it can implement uh, it in countries. Uh, in countries uh, with low educational opportunity with the support of other development countries within the framework of the development of education in general in the world. As for UNESCO and UNICEF, we have learned that UNESCO and UNICEF uh, have worked uh, on projects similar to ours, and we can tell them about our project and it may create a, 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 an opportunity for cooperation available and they can help us in several things. Uh, this is all of our project and we hope that we have been able to explain it uh, in an understandable way. Thank you. Here's a little meme for you guys, and we are also are open for questions if, if anyone has. I love your meme. This is amazing, an amazing project that's, you know, is close to home as we are also an education initiative. I wanted to ask about, um, I mean, there's no doubt that just like gaining information or just learning more is something that will benefit people individually and societies at large. But I wanted to ask if there was ways that you were hoping to integrate 
like this educational opportunity into the ed educational structure of Sudan, whether it's like providing certificates or some sort of like support so that people can continue their education should they want to. Uh, okay, so one of the actual improvements we are hoping to make, we, we are going to, to make a, a postgraduate program for the people who are, for the children graduated from the, our night school so they can have a, can have a chance to go to college and so it's one of the possible imp improvements we have also a lot a lot of ideas for improvements our, our our project and spread it nationally and internationally we just can't talk about them all because of the time that is understandable well i hope you know, this actually ends up being something in the future. I would love to see all of these projects in general, but it would be great to see how this works out and all of your ideas. <laughs> yes, wonderful job to our last group. Uh, thank you so much. This is a very important topic, um, you know, when it comes to the education and the literacy of children across uh, the country and the way you guys laid it out from the beginning to the end and even different partners like UNICEF or UNESCO who have done similar things, thinking about how to partner with them in the future. Uh, very great job and a great amount of detail. So thank you. And we wanna say thank you to all of our groups and to all of our students. They really put in a lot of work with us during the last week um, and they tried their best in all aspects, you know, with different issues with electricity and with uh, the connection. They still all came to class every day, sometimes even though they had to connect three, four, five times. Um, they were very active with us uh, outside of class and in their groups. So thank you guys so much. Uh, you really made the program what it is and we're very proud of your final presentations. And we hope that some of these projects go forward in the future. Uh, so we're gonna wrap up our live stream presentation. I just wanna give an uh, opportunity to all of our teachers if they wanna say a quick word. So we have Sahad, Awa, then Diane. You guys want to say something quickly? Uh, I think we have to start with Diane. Diane has been our superstar instructor. So Diane, please uh, take the stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, salam everyone. Um, I just want to say this has been super fun in this past week to teach and also learn with you guys. Um, I learned so much during these presentations and it's it's super cool to see you integrate the topics that we talked about and some of the concepts. Um, and I really hope that uh, you continue to work on the things that you care about um, to help make Sudan and the world as they do say in their memes better. Um, so yes, we have it. Yeah, I'll, I'll just echo on what Diane said. I think everyone did, did an amazing job. I think it's quite impressive. You had such a limited time, all the challenges that Ilham mentioned. And you had to work as groups with people that you have never met before. Um, that in itself is a challenge for a lot of people. Um, I think this presentation and in this live stream, you have showed the people who have watched the live stream, the ones who are going to watch the recording and all of us here, um, you know, what Sudanese youth are capable of and what we care about and uh, what we can do. And uh, inshallah, yani, I think Sudan is in very safe hands with your ideas and with your thoughts. And we're very excited to see those things come to fruition. It's great that we had some ideas that will take years to happen. And we had some ideas that already started taking place. Uh, it's a great spectrum you know, of, of how we can do things at any time, at any place, and, and your will to do it. So thank you for that. And um, we're really, really excited, very proud of what you've done and really excited to see what you'll be doing moving forward. I can keep it short, but I mean, I'm so, so impressed, like so impressed. It takes like these types of projects are things that I've seen take semesters and years for people to develop from things that are as small as like a final class to final theses. And that is like what I see a lot of potential for what has been presented here today. And yeah, I mean, it's just the fact that y'all did it in the short time with the people like via like, like the internet, with all the struggles that are happening in the country, I mean, and I, I am inspired. So shukran, like, thank you all so much. And I really do hope in the future, yeah, I, mean, I get to see the development of all of these projects. And um, yeah, I mean, if there's any way that we can further support this, is, like, I would love to do it, like, personally, but also as Zahra as an organization. So please, please keep in touch, but also keep us posted about what y'all decide to do. 
and inshallah yani, i'll get to hear amazing news in the future okay thank you so much everyone with that we're gonna end the live stream uh for the students we'll still we'll still be here in, in class um just to say bye to you guys um but we're gonna go ahead and end the live stream so thank you to everyone who tuned in and the video will be saved on zahra's page so you can go back and watch it as well <laughs>